I, Brigadier Theophilus Yakubu Danjuma, being appointed a member of the Supreme Military Council, swear that I will not directly or indirectly reveal such matters as shall be debated in the council in the said council and committed to my secrecy. In every successful coup, there is a disruption in the military chain of command and the executors must decide on the best way to reorganize and replace the government they have just deposed. The best options for the executors are 1. They may choose to submit to the authority of the overall military commander, as it happened when the majors who staged Nigeria's first coup in 1966 submitted to the authority of the GOC, Major General Agui Ironsi. Now, what are your relations with General Ironsi in Lagos? Well, very good. He's my boss. I uh, have always been under him, and uh, I still am. I still am under him. If there is still any problem with you, uh, misunderstandings arose, but uh, this, this was due to the publication in the press and by announcements over the radio. At some time, they started calling us in Sabrina Rebel. Two, they may choose to entrust governmental responsibilities to a group of senior officers they respect, as it occurred in 1975 when Colonels Yaradua, Obangida, Buhari, Abdullahi Mohammed, and Taiwo, who planned and executed the coup that deposed General Gowon, nominated the three brigadiers, Mutala Mohammed, Obasanjo, and Tiwai Danjuma, to form a troika and run the government. And three, the third option is that the executors may choose to operate and run the new regime by themselves. This option is the most risky and usually requires the expulsion not only of superior officers, but also other cohorts or junior colleagues who do not share the planner's political inclination. This house cleaning is usually achieved by retirement, death or posting. As for the coup of January 31st, 1983, it was a third option for the executors. Even though they were senior officers, they were not the most senior in the army. There were several three-star and two-star generals that were either senior to them or equivalent in seniority. The successful conspirators had decided what to do with their superiors and colleagues. Major General Babangida and Brigadier Tunde Idiagbon informed the service chiefs Lieutenant General Gibson Jalo, Lieutenant General Mohammed Wushishi, Air Vice Marshal Abdullahi Dominic, and Vice Admiral Akin Aduo that their services were no longer required. All four of them were immediately retired and placed in protective custody for four days at Bonnie Camp in Lagos. Major General Mohamed Buhari's newly formed cabinet included Domkat Bali as Defense Minister, General Babangida as Chief of Army Staff, and Babangida's old classmate Maman Vata was appointed Minister of the Federal Capital Territory outside the Army chain of command, a move that prevented either of the former classmates from serving under each other. A vital lesson from Dimka's 1976 botched coup and the promotions exercise that preceded it is that army promotions during military regimes are extremely sensitive matter that can provoke coup plots. Babangida's elevation to chief of army staff caused the premature retirement or posting overseas of several officers senior to him. Over 180 officers were also retired in the aftermath of the coup. The regime named itself the Federal Military Government and created multiple governing organs that replicated the instruments of government used by the previous military governments dissolved in 1979. The FMG's apex organ was the Supreme Military Council. It became the new legislature in place of the National Assembly and the confirming authority for cabinet decisions. The SMC membership constituted of Buhari, Idiabon, Babangida, and the Inspector General of Police and other senior military officers. The executive governing organ was the Federal Executive Council, a largely civilian cabinet of ministers and a few military officers. The third body was the National Council of States, a body which supervised the government of the states and whose membership consisted of Buhari, Idiabon, Bali, the service chiefs and the military governors. Military governors replaced the ousted elected civilian governors. At federal level, the FMG legislated by means of military decrees, while at state levels, military governors were empowered to enact legislation in form of edicts, which had effects only within the states they governed, and the courts were barred from questioning the validity 
of any decree. The SMC was markedly different from the inexperienced officers who took power when the army first ventured into politics in 1966. It was the most politically experienced military government in Nigeria's history. The SMC was dominated by Civil War veteran officers who had prior political experience as members of previous military regimes. The head of state, Buhari, was the Minister of Petroleum and Military Governor of Borno State during the previous military regime. His deputy, Brigadier Tunde Idiabong, was also a former military governor of Borno State. Babangida, Bali, Ukiwe, Atompera, Duba, and Alpha had all been members of the previous military regime of General Abasanjo, and Major General Vata served as Abasanjo's Brigade of Guards commander. The Buhari regime came to office with tremendous goodwill from the public and press jubilantly welcomed the military's return to politics. Public opinion welcomed Buhari's promise of a relentless fight against corruption. However, corruption was not the only battle on the horizon. The regime's policy mirrored the personality of its leader and deputy leader. Buhari and Idiagbon were stern, unsmiling, no-nonsense officers that conformed to public stereotype of how uncompromising army officers should behave. They identified indiscipline as a trait that had infected the Nigerian psyche. The regime aimed to fight not just corruption, but to instill order and social decency into Nigerians by force or at least by compulsion. With great fanfare, the regime launched a nationwide campaign called War Against Indiscipline, Why? Why was launched by Brigadier Tunde Idiagbon at a public ceremony on March 20, 1984 in Lagos. I want you to bear in mind, you need to emphasize self-discipline and leadership by good example. Begin by drawing public attention to little but important everyday manifestations of indiscipline, such as rushing into battle, driving on the wrong side of the road, littering the streets, parks, and dwelling compounds, cheating, taking on due advantage of scarcity to inflate prices for quick monetary gains, constituting ourselves into public nuisances, working without commitment, and devoting little or no time to the upbringing of our children. School children were required to line up and sing the national anthem before commencement of school each day. The last Saturday of the month was declared Sanitation Saturday. It was a day when Nigerians were supposed to stay at home and clean up, and vehicles were barred from the road to facilitate environmental sanitation. At the state levels, a monthly prize was being given to the states with the best environmental sanitation. Nigerians took to why grudgingly at first, but began to appreciate the benefits of queuing and cleaner streets. Military-style punishments like frog jump were dished out to why offenders. This undoubtedly helped coerce adherents. Colonel Oladik Bodia, the military governor of Ogun State, supported why with much enthusiasm. While the national economy reeled from a recession, the elites were still busy flaunting their wealth, most of which was ill-gotten and hosting lavish expensive parties. Dia imposed a tax on night parties as a way of discouraging such ostentation and raising funds for government projects. Some other military governors, anxious to publicly declare loyalty to the FMG's pledge to get tough on crime, suggested more macabre punishments for armed robbers. Lieutenant Colonel David Mark, military governor of Niger State, advocated that convicted armed robbers should be burned alive. Colonel Oladik Bodia was in favor of shooting arm robbers in their own communities as a deterrent and to shame their families. It was no surprise then when the FMG approved the public execution of arm robbers. The early 1980s were marked by spectacular government corruption. Although corruption had existed before, this time it was amplified by the increased availability of money in federal politics. Since there was more money around, the axing price for kickbacks rose correspondingly 
and the corruption became unashamedly brazen. Government ministry buildings would mysteriously burst into flames just before audits, making it impossible to discover written evidence of corruption. Immediately after the New Year's Eve school, the FMG closed all borders and arrested and detained approximately 475 politicians and businessmen for corruption. Among the detainees were President Shehu Shagari, Vice President Alex Ekweme, and Emeka Ojuku, who had been recently returned to Nigeria and joined the ruling NPN after over 10 years in exile. Tales of corruption scandals among public officials were rife. Rooms stacked from floor to ceiling with illicit cash being discovered in politicians' houses and politicians' secret bank accounts with outrageous balances. The FMG created military tribunals to operate as watershed, non-beg-style trials which would free Nigeria from its corrupt past. It was the first time the Nigerian public officials were tried and jailed for corruption. If found guilty, a defendant faced a minimum sentence of 21 years in prison. The only right of appeal from the tribunal's verdict was to the SMC. The military were effectively acting as prosecutor, judge, and jury. The tribunals also obtained the principle of innocence until proven guilty by putting the onus on the accused to prove their innocence. Several prominent politicians were convicted of various corruption charges and given massive prison sentences ranging from 20 to 200 years. Among these convicted were Finance Minister Victor Masi, former Kano State Governor Abubakar Rimi and his successor Sabo Bakin Zuo, Anthony Enahoro, Bola Ige, Solomon La, Sam Mbekwe, Jim Nwobodun, Aperaku, Ambrose Ali, Adamu Atta, and Awal Ibrahim. The tribunals effectively put Nigeria's political elite in jail for life. Given that most of the convicts were already in their 40s or 50s, they were likely to die in prison of old age if they served their sentences. Some SMC members such as Babangida and Bali thought the sentences were too harsh and advocated reducing them without any success. Military officers as well as civilians were targeted by the anti-corruption drive. In October 1984, Colonel Peter Obasa, the Director General of NYSC, was jailed for 22 years after being accused of embezzlement in his handling of NYSC affairs. The FMG also announced a harsh crackdown on drug dealing. It enacted Decree 20, which prescribed the death penalty for convicted drug dealers. And on April 14, 1985, three drug dealers were sentenced to death and executed by firing squad. A few weeks later, the SMC approved the execution of three more drug dealers, including one Mrs. Gladys Inyama, a mother of two paraplegic children. She was the first woman in Nigerian history to be executed by a firing squad. Conscious of the brutality of publicly executing a woman, the FMG authorized the execution in private Akirikiri Maximum Security Prison in Lagos, but the sentence was never carried out. Buhari's tough stance on crime and corruption and the use of the death sentence for convicted drug traffickers endangered members of the elite who were involved in these practices. He had already imprisoned several prominent members of the political elite and his uncompromising stance on corruption was threatening the future economic livelihood of corrupt military, business and political elites who had not yet been incarcerated. A split opened in the SMC with Buhari Idiagbong Maguru and Rafinadi on one side, and Babangida heading the opposition. The cleavage was further widened by policy differences between Babangida and the duo of Buhari and Idiagbong. Babangida opposed Decree 4, the long jail terms being given to politicians, and Buhari's approach to negotiations with international lending institutions. But the pivotal point that pushed the tension between Buhari and Babangida into overt confrontation was Buhari's investigation into financial irregularities at the Ministry of Defense. The investigation threatened Babangida directly as he had been working at army headquarters in the previous years and currently as the chief of army staff. The investigation led to the discovery of suspicious financial disbursements and alleged racketeering by Babangida's close ally, Colonel Aliu Mohammed. 
Muhammad's explanations that the disbursements were used to fund the coup that brought Buhari to power were not accepted and Buhari retired Muhammad. Babangida also claimed that the national security officer was monitoring the activities of SMC members and had even bugged his own telephone lines. Major General Bali later claimed that Babangida and Abacha were really very frightened under Buhari. Nobody knew the reason, but they were really hysterically jittery and desperate. The Buhari regime made a serious political miscalculation by declining to reveal a program or timetable for the return to democracy. It stated that it could not prioritize a return to civilian rule as it was too focused on tackling the political and economic crisis it inherited. This made the leadership appear myopic and directionless. The ethnic and religious composition of Buhari's SMC also concerned Southerners. Although the SMC's membership was increased to 21, virtually all of its senior positions were held by Northern Muslims. Only eight SMC members were from the South. By not presenting the timetable for the restoration of democracy, attempting to muzzle the press, and having no solutions to worsening economic conditions, Buhari and Idiagbong played into the hands of conspirators within the military. Buhari further escalated his problem by not rewarding key junior and mid-ranking officers who were essentially coup specialists. Other officers in the government and junior officers took their complaints to Babangida. Major General Ibrahim Babangida was Buhari's greatest threat, although Buhari did not seem to realize it. There's a school of thoughts that Buhari was simply used by a pro-Babangida faction within the military to gain stability for military government, with a long-term intention to ultimately remove Buhari to pave the way for a rule by a faction. Babangida was merely going to use the post as a launching pad to the presidency. Prior to being overthrown, Nigerian leaders often demonstrate a fatalistic reluctance to heed overt warning or correctly interpret danger signals. Balewa and Amadou Bello were murdered a few days after failing to respond to warnings from cabinet ministers and senior army officers about an impending military coup. Agui Ronsi was murdered by soldiers in his own guard detail after refusing to believe warning that they were plotting against him. Gowon was overthrown by his own trusted officer after refusing to believe concrete intelligence reports, directly naming and linking those officers with a coup plot against him. Mutala Mohammed was shot dead in his unescorted vehicle shortly after his deputy, Olushego Nobasanjo, urged him to take his personal security more seriously. Buhari and Idiagbon demonstrated the same self-destructing tendency to ignore danger signs. In early 1985, a military intelligence officer, Colonel Chris Ali, privately voiced his concerns about rumors of a coup to Major General Tunde Idiagbon. Idiagbon, in his usual reticent manner, simply replied, let them try. After being informed of a coup by his Langtan kinsmen, Bali claimed that he warned Buhari, who nonchalantly replied that he had confidence in his guards' ability to do their job. According to Babangida, the planning to overthrow Buhari began in January 1985, just one year after Buhari came to office. Babangida says it was a collective decision to overthrow Buhari. There was a subtle plot by Babangida loyalists to discredit Buhari's regime. They would sanction publicly unpopular measures that made Buhari appear harsh and unsympathetic. These included the arrest and detention of government opponents and journalists, the execution of drug dealers, a raid on the home of Chief Obafemi Awolowo and the seizure of his passports, and the stifling of political debates on when the country would return to civilian rule. On April 15, 1985, the Minister of Internal Affairs, Major General Mohamed Maguru, suddenly announced the FMG's intention to expel all illegal immigrants in Nigeria before May 10th. With oil prices dropping, a depressed economy and rising unemployment and inflation, illegal immigrants were an easy target. The sudden expulsion order caused severe hardship on foreigners who were forced to leave at short notice. Chaotic mile-long queues of refugees built on Nigeria's borders 
as illegal immigrants frantically tried to leave before the expiry date of the deadline. None were allowed to depart with more than 22 Naira. At 6 p.m. May 10th, Nigeria closed its borders, trapping hundreds of thousands of refugees who were not able to leave before the deadline. Buhari took the blame for all these decisions, but later revealed that they were sanctioned by the same men who overthrew him. It was all part of a plot to make the regime unpopular enough to create public support for a military takeover. Buhari's regime also contributed to its own downfall in certain ways. To prevent currency trafficking and to make worthless the illicit cash being hoarded by politicians, the Buhari regime changed Nigeria's currency notes at a short notice. The regime was also accused of nepotism, and one popular incident occurred at the airport, where usually vigilance and strict screening of luggage was the order of the day. Against this backdrop, the Emir of Gwandu, who also happens to be Major Mustafa Haruna Jakolu, ADC to Buhari's father, was allowed through Mutala Mohammed International Airport with 53 suitcases belonging to him. None of the suitcases were ever screened. Because of the connection the Emir had to the regime, it looked as if the law did not apply to those with close connection to the FMG. Babangida had created a mini personality cult within the military. He systematically cultivated a loyal following of psychophantic mid ranking officers over the years by making grandois gestures and buying lavish presents for officers junior to him. Additionally, many of the officers in key army units were either his former cadets from his days as instructor at the Nigerian Defense Academy or served under him when he commanded the Amor Corps. Such officers included Abubakar Umar, Mohamed Buba Marwa, Tunde Ogbeha, Lawan Gwadabe, Joshua Madaki, Chris Garba, John Mark Inyengi, and Ndong Esiet Nkanga. These men staged the coup that brought Buhari to power and Babangida established networks of direct personal loyalty from them to him. With his superior charm, Babangida could then easily draw on the reservoir of goodwill to convince them to switch loyalty and abandon Buhari. Babangida's job was made easier by the fact that many junior officers who were instrumental in bringing Buhari to power felt underrepresented in the FMG. Some were aggrieved that having brought the military to power, they were not permitted to exercise power and enjoy the wealth and patronage associated with it. In a subsequent interview, Buhari recalled that I was removed because certain members of my cabinet felt because they were in public office, they were entitled to things other than what is specified in their terms and conditions of service. Although Buhari was his close friend, for Babangida, this was strictly business. He later remarked that to be able to stage a coup, you have to be close to somebody. I was a very good friend of Buhari, there's no doubt about it. To finalize the plot, Babangida toured army formations under the pretext of conducting his duties as chief of army staff. Lieutenant Colonel David Mark, military governor of Niger State, Babangida's home state, provided cover for the conspirators by facilitating their meetings in Babangida's hometown, Mina. However, there was one last obstacle in Babangida's takeover plan, and that was the GOC of the second division in Ibadan, Major General Sani Abacha. If Babangida could not obtain his support for the coup, it would fail and Babangida and his co-conspirators would end up in front of a firing squad. General Sani Abacha was a mysterious figure, so Babangida approached Abacha personally to plead for his support in deposing Buhari, realizing that only direct approach could talk him around. According to Babangida, nobody could get him to be involved except me because of our relationship. If it were any other person, he would have gone to the side of Buhari. But when I sat him down, he said, You are my chief. Anything you want, I will do. On the evening of August 26, 1985, Buhari was joined in his residence by Majors Abubakar Dangiwa Umar, Lawan Gwadabi, Abdul Mumuni Aminu, and Sambu Dasuki. The Majors arrested Buhari at gunpoint. Buhari's ADC, Major Mustafa Jakolu, was also arrested at the Ikeja cantonment after being sent by Buhari to check the situation of things there. After the coup, 
Buhari was detained for more than two years, badly affecting his family life and causing him to divorce his wife upon release. At 6 a.m. on August 27, 1985, Brigadier Joshua Dogonyaru made a nationwide broadcast announcing the dissolution of the SMC, FEC, and National Council of States. The announcement also imposed a dusk till dawn curfew in Lagos and all state capitals and told the public to stand by for further announcements. Brigadier Idiagbon was out of the country on a religious visit to Saudi Arabia but returned to the country after hearing about the coup, even though he knew he would be arrested and placed in detention as soon as he got back. The coup was executed largely by northern and middle belt minority officers, including Major General Abacha, Brigadier Dogoyaru and Husseini, Lieutenant Colonels David Mark, John Shagaya and Ahmed Abdullahi, Majors Umar, Gwadabe, Aminu and Dasuki. Some of the soldiers involved in the coup looted Buhari's personal property in Lagos. His removal in a palace coup by the same officers who brought him to office was reminiscent of General Gowan's overthrow in 1975 by the same soldiers who staged the coup that brought him into power. Nigerians were kept in the dark about the new leader until Major General Sani Abacha appeared in combat fatigues on national television to make a follow-up broadcast announcing Babangida's appointment as the new head of state and commander-in-chief of the armed forces of Nigeria. <laughs> 